Welcome to this Zoom meeting where we're going to introduce you to four experts who will show you that higher blood levels of vitamin D, which is a potent steroid pro-hormone, not just a nutrient, can help to reduce your risk of catching any coronavirus or reduce the severity of the illness. I had the pleasure in 2011 of hosting a conference where three of these people spoke. And the first one is Michael Hollick, Bill Grant, and then David Grimes. So this is our agenda for today. Let's continue. Now, who is the target audience for this? We'd like to show this to the experts, and uh, I'm based in the UK, in NICE and Sacken and so on. These are the people advising the ministers, and we'd like to show it to the politicians, any doctors and nurses and other medical people. That's great. Health insurance companies would benefit from understanding this, and of course, it's for everyone. Now, they're, they're going to be, in case of confusion, the Americans use nanograms per mil. And in the UK, we use the SI units of nanomoles. So in the UK, we have a definition of deficiency that is set by the Department of Health, probably to save money, which is 25 nanomoles or 10 nanograms. America has 20 nanograms. There's very good evidence that for good bone health, you need 30 nanograms. And there are some experts who issued a call to action who say that they think that the level ought to be, the optimum level is between 40 and 60. Hello, uh, my name's Gareth Davis. I'm a physicist and technology entrepreneur specializing in AI. I have a PhD in medical physics from Imperial College, and since March, I've been working on a uh, working as a coronavirus scientist in collaboration with two doctors, two medical doctors. And in March, we discovered compelling evidence that vitamin D deficiency was the main cause of severe coronavirus disease. So in May, we published a formal proof of this using a causal inference framework, which is a technique developed for AI, um, and also borrowing a method from physics, uh, a method of proof from physics, which can be used to distinguish causation from correlation using only observable data and that, uh, without the need for uh, an interventional trial. Uh, causal inference is pretty new to medicine, so I'm going to explain here what we did. The first thing that we noticed was that there was a really striking northern hemisphere bias in terms of the death. So pretty much below the 30 degrees north latitude line, the number of deaths uh, that, were, that were occurring was almost negligible. And yet the world population clearly uh, doesn't match that pattern. And the number of deaths per million on the right um, was clearly uh, very, very high in the north and almost negligible in the south for all locations. So this is a geobubble plot that shows the severity of the outbreaks using a simple formula that takes deaths and recoveries. Uh, and you can see here that above 30 degrees, there were huge, terrible outbreaks, uh, most uh, early on Italy, but um, Wuhan, the origin of the um, the outbreak, uh, and then in Spain and the rest of uh, Europe. This is up to the 28th of March. Um, this is the same severity index plotted, but this time using a logarithmic scale because some of the points were just so small, as you saw, they just didn't appear. And again, keeping that going to the 9th of April, so a little bit after March, we, uh, we saw the blue here is uh, locations that did appear to be uh, having outbreaks, but then went uh, in negative, which in, in the case of this severity index means that the outbreak was completely controlled. And you can see here, Brazil just started to have a severe outbreak um, at the beginning of April. But until then, it, there were no countries in the Southern Hemisphere. So an obvious question is, well, was this because the Northern Hemisphere was infected first. But actually, when we looked at the timeline of when people were reporting deaths and recoveries, in fact, most of um, Asia and the Oceania countries, so Australia and New Zealand, actually got the infection well before Europe. And yet, they didn't have outbreaks severe, uh, anywhere near as severe as we did. 
So that's extremely surprising. Now, the pattern of outbreak happened to match the known seasonal pattern of vitamin D deficiency because vitamin D is produced in the skin in strong sunlight. And it's known that coronaviruses uh, follow this seasonal trend. So this is how we started to spot the patterns that suggested that vitamin D deficiency might be the reason. We also know that vitamin D is uh, is actually a hormone, not a vitamin, and it's involved in immune function. So there's a lot of research from the last 20 years that suggests that actually it's because of um, vitamin D deficiency causing the immune system to break down uh, and not function properly. And that mapped exactly onto the pattern that we were seeing. Uh, so what we did is in order to prove that the patterns we were seeing were causation and not just correlation, because vitamin D uh, deficiency is correlated with lots of different things, we decided to apply a causal inference framework. Now, this is uh, an, a technique from AI, but we also uh, but we applied it slightly differently using a method in, from physics because the uh, um, to use the normal method requires ex a, a great deal of very high quality data which uh, around serum levels, which we didn't have. But what we did have was a, um, a great deal of data about lots of other things that we could use to prove. So we created what are called directed acyclic graphs. And these are fundamental to causal inference and then models of the cause and effect chain uh, through to any particular outcome. In this case, it's COVID-19 and, um, and death. So we categorized all of the root causes that impact vitamin D serum levels so that anything that increases vitamin D, anything that decreases vitamin D. Um, and then we also looked at categorizing illnesses into three categories. So that because we don't know if some illnesses cause vitamin D deficiency, whether some illnesses are caused by vitamin D deficiency, and presumably some are, are not impacted at all. So by creating this model, this gives us a, a clear way to look at the cause and effect chain. Uh, and we created two models. They're essentially the same model, but with certain lines cut. So on the left, we've got the causal model. And on the right, we have the acausal or bystander model. And in that, we've cut the lines that would link all of the root causes and vitamin D having an impact on COVID-19. So you can see there are no lines going from those. Uh, and what we can do now uh, is borrow a method from physics, which is called the hypothetical deductive method. And we can make predictions using these models about what we would expect to see in the observable data that we're looking at. And we made 16, well, we made 19 predictions from these models. Uh, for example, looking at the Northern Hemisphere, we would predict that fatality rates uh, in would be generally high because of, it was in winter and people's vitamin D levels were low. But the exceptions would be places where people were known to, for example, eat a very high fish diet, because it's pretty much the only way you can get vitamin D from the diet is through either eating oily fish all day or, uh, or taking supplements. Um, we would expect uh, certain populations to be severely affected, and those would be people, uh, the so-called BAME community with naturally dark skin, um, because melanin blocks ultraviolet light, which converts cholesterol into the first form of vitamin D. And if you've got naturally dark skin, that won't happen. So people uh, with dark skin living in northern climes in the winter are much more likely to be vitamin D deficient and therefore much more at risk if um, if this was causal, they would be much more likely to die. So we predicted that Bain communities would have higher fatality rates. Uh, and we made a number of predictions like that. Of the 19 predictions that we made, 16 were testable and three were not because were, we didn't have the data to do that. And so we built a table and looked at the data and uh, saw, made comparisons about whether those predictions matched observable data for the causal model or the bystander model. And, uh, and because there are so many predictions that we were able to make, that gives what's called triangulation confidence. Because if one prediction was uh, didn't match, that wouldn't mean much. But by the time you get to 16 predictions, all coming from different root variables, the probability of being of the model being wrong and the predictions uh, just being random uh, diminishes. The more predictions you can make, the more confidence you can have. And also, 
in any model, whether it's a trial or an observational method like this, the number of data points that you consider is also uh, a strong indicator of confidence. And we analyzed uh, 1.6 million uh, reported data points from 240 reporting locations. So the, uh, the, the, this method is capable of producing a very, very accurate and reliable method of uh, uh, result in, in deciding whether or not vitamin D deficiency was causing uh, the results that we were observing in the world. And in fact, the results were really black and white and quite striking. The causal model uh, all 16 predictions matched what we saw in the 1.6 million data points, and all 16 of the uh, bystander model or the A causal model contradicted what we were seeing. Some very strongly, and some uh, less obviously. So, but they still contradicted. So that's very, very strong evidence that vitamin D deficiency uh, was at cause. We also looked at uh, historical evidence. So. Um, if vitamin D supplementation is effective at uh, defending against uh, flu viruses, coronaviruses, respiratory viruses in general, then we should know from vitamin D fortification whether that works. And it turns out that between 1930 and 1950, so that's um, this period marked in yellow here, there was a period where vitamin D uh, was added to food routinely around the world. And in fact, uh, you can see here that there were no new strains of flu during a period from 1920 to 1957 until that vitamin D fortification was banned. And it was banned for uh, uh, reasons that turned out not to be true. So there were scares that people were overdosing on vitamin D, but it turned out to be something else. So that's really remarkable historical evidence that vitamin D fortification in the general population can actually suppress uh, these flu viruses and, and, uh, and presumably coronaviruses, as, well, as we've proven, to the point where there aren't enough viral particles for mutations to happen in great numbers. And, and you can see after 1957, when vitamin D deficiency became a problem again, and which is documented, we started to see lots and lots of mutations because in the world population, there were lots and lots of people getting flu. Uh, finally, uh, we, I won't go into this into a great detail because it's rather complicated um, and not the point of our proof, but there's a huge body of research showing how vitamin D uh, biologically interacts with the immune system. We used to think vitamin D just stopped rickets. In other words, it stopped, it helps laying calcium down onto your bones. But in the last 20 years, we've discovered it's actually a fundamental hormone that's uh, that in impacts the immune system, both the innate immune system, which is the first responder uh, when you first get an infection, the adaptive immune system, which is where you, you develop antibodies to a particular pathogen. And, the, and we know specifically the mechanisms by which vitamin D uh, interacts with many, many systems and other hormones like estrogen, and, uh, and, the, and specifically with respect to ACE2, the uh, cell receptor that the virus uses to gain entry into uh, our cells. So that really constitutes all together these mechanisms, uh, the causal inference proof predictions, the historical evidence, uh, to all together, taken together, form rock solid concrete proof that vitamin D deficiency is causing worse outcomes. We know exactly why it is, uh, and we've seen in the data that it's causing exactly the outcomes um, in subpopulations that we would expect to see if that was the case. Thank you for your attention. Thank you all for those great presentations. I'm Rufus Greenbaum. I'm a citizen scientist. I'm interested in preventive health. And as a result of some of my work, my inner age is my real age minus 18. As a scientist, I understand the difference between hypothesis and RCT evidence. I've been corresponding with the UK government about vitamin D since 2009. If you want to see my original letter, follow that link, ISGD RG Sacken 2009. I had the great honour and privilege of organising four conferences about vitamin D in 2010 and 2011. And again, you can see those if you look at this link. I currently publish the blog, vitamindduk.com, and I have been commercially involved since 2015 
you have to take that into account in what I'm saying. Now, here is the annual blood level of vitamin D in a UK population over a two or three year period. And you can see, and this is all white skinned people. These were people born in 1958. And the test was done in 2002, three and four. At the end of the winter, their natural blood level was 35 nanomoles and it rises to 75 nanomoles in September. It's September the 24th now. This week we've passed the autumn solstice and the blood levels will start falling. Now, what do you need to do with vitamin D? It, it depends on your target. If your target is 25 nanomoles, which is the current UK definition of deficient, well, there's no problem. No preventive action required. If, on the other hand, it's 50 nanomoles, there's a minor deficiency for a few months. And again, there's no major preventive action required. But what if you set your target at 75 nanomoles? Well, now everybody in the UK is deficient all year round. Now what do we do? And if you follow the experts' guidance that says we ought to have 100 to 150 nanomoles, everyone is very deficient all year round. Now, what action is required? And what that means is you have to go from our UK definition of 25 nanomoles up to 100 to 150. You actually have to increase the blood level by four to six times. This is the A plot from Scotland. Look how low they get. In February, they're down at 10 nanomoles, and they don't get much above 45 nanomoles. They've got a problem in Scotland up at 56 to 57 degrees north. Two key facts. If you want to understand the importance of vitamin D, you need to accept these two key statements as facts. If your blood level is less than 100 nanomoles, then you are liable to suffer from some of 88 different health conditions. And vitamin D is a potent steroid pro-hormone made in your body from sunlight or supplements, and very little can be obtained from food. It is not a nutrient. Second, go away. It's nothing to do with you. Many doctors have been wrongly taught that only a very low level of vitamin D is required, and it's only to avoid problems with bones and muscles. If you persist with this belief, you'll probably reject all the assertions of our speakers and the evidence that higher levels are needed for better health. So read more about it. Here are some links. Follow the, my blog and Grassroots Health and Vitamin D Wiki. Health outcomes, very good evidence that people with dark skin have lower blood levels of vitamin D than people with light skin. And then when, they're at, when their levels are equalized, then their health outcomes become similar. And this explains why people with darker skin have worse outcomes. Follow that link to look further. If you live further away from the equator than 30 degrees north or south, then you cannot make enough vitamin D from the sun all year round. And in your winter, you will need to find another light source of UVB or take vitamin D supplements. Again, have a look at the shadow rule. There is a delightful talk on TED by Professor Nina Jablonski about the effect of health and skin color and migration. A beautiful talk. Many people who live an outdoor life near the equator, like the Maasai warriors or Hawaii lifeguards, have natural blood levels of 100 to 150 nanomoles. There's an American doctor who walks on a Florida beach every day without a shirt, and he has a vitamin D level of 117. My test results, I take 5,000 IU of vitamin D each day. My last test was 143 nanomoles. 
But look down the bottom of this slide that the test lab said greater than 50 was adequate. So my doctor's going to look at this and say, oh, you're, okay. you're well over the, the amount. The test labs, DEQUAS in the UK, have to adjust the test result adequate level to be greater than 75 and preferably above 100. How much do I need? How much vitamin D do I need to raise my levels to the lower limit of 100 nanomoles? In winter, I, I need 4,000 IU a day. In summer, maybe only 2,000 a day. It may be that people are more compliant with a weekly supplement. That's good enough. Obese people should increase the dose, maybe double required. Vitamin D is fat soluble. Larger people have less. Those people who cover their bodies should take the full winter dose all year long. Muslim women, religious people who cover their bodies. If you don't take a loading dose, it may take 90 to 120 days to stabilize. The dose response varies for about 10% of the population. Have a look at grassroots health to see a study of people taking large doses. And it's required for life. Many doctors think it's like iron, where you only need a one-off top-up. No, you need it for life. And maybe whole families should be tested or supplemented. Well, what are the next steps? Well, let's monitor and supplement vitamin D levels to greater than 100. The benefit to cost is massive for people at risk. It's an easy, hard challenge. Every step is easy, but making it happen everywhere is hard. Who needs to take action in the UK? Our experts need to understand this properly. Nice, Sacken, Nerve Tag, Sage and Public Health England. Our politicians need to understand it. And our blood test laboratories need to understand it. Who can take local action? Every doctor and nurse can take action today. Pharmacists can take action today. Public health directors need to understand this and take action. Unfortunately, not all public health directors are medically qualified, but they ought to ask some of the experts for guidance. Health visitors and midwives can make a massive difference, and so can care home staff. And think about what would be the benefit for health insurance companies. The major ones in the UK are Bupa, PPP and WPA. They would benefit from wide supplement supplementation. Their clients would live longer and pay them premiums for a longer time. So for more information, look at the scientific information on the tolerable upper intake from the European Food Safety Agency. Follow that link. Look at the expert's call to de-action on grassroots health. And for proof that vitamin D works, have a look at vitamin D wiki with the section proof that vitamin D works. What are the next steps? Who needs to take action? Everyone. What do you need to do? Boost your vitamin D to 100 to 150 nanomoles. Why? Because you'll live longer in better health. Where do you need to do it? Everywhere. And when do you need to do it? You need to do it now. You want to learn more? Look at my blog, Vitamin D UK. Look at Vitamin D Wiki. Look at Grassroots Health. And vitamindassociation.org events has videos from my conferences from 2011. I'm very proud of those conferences. They were videoed. They're up on YouTube. And they are a great learning resource. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.